In this episode, we sit down with Joe Woodhouse, also known on his social channels as Joe Family Wealth. Financial advisor and business owner, Joe's built up quite a following on his social channels over the last few years by sharing insights how to become better with money, how to save money, and what to do and what not to do when it comes to your finances. But in this episode, we delve a little bit deeper into Joe's story, the highs and lows, and everything in between. This episode is not to be missed. I hope you enjoy it. Joe. There we go. Thanks for coming on, Matt. Pleasure as always, mate. Where did your love and passion for finance in terms of you becoming a financial advisor on Instagram, you know, and Joe Family Wealth? <laughs> where, did, where did that love and passion for not only finance, but helping people with their finances come from? I initially fell into it because my brother playing Sunday League football. Okay. Um, so I left school at 15, 16 year old. Didn't know what I wanted to do but I knew what I didn't want to do. So my dad's a market trader. So my dad sells second-hand bric-a-brac, Sheffield, Chesterfield, Rotherham Markets. And I know I didn't want to do that and stand outside in the cold. And I know I didn't want to be a bin man. And I had it drilled into me at school that without A-levels and a degree, you're either a bin man or you work with your, dad's on, work with your dad on the markets. So I went to college. So I was go. So this was in the summer, uh, being 16, 15, 16 year old in the summer, I was going to college in the September. Finished school, got a few GCSEs, and then my mum, mum and dad were like, "Right, you know, you get a job." I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm good at college. They were like, "Yeah, but you're getting a part-time job." So they'd keep me out of the house every day, and I'd go and hide around the corner, <laughs> wait till they went to work, then come back and just play my Xbox on my PlayStation all day. And after a couple of weeks, my mum's, my mum, me, me younger brother used to play Sunday league football. And my mum went, mum and dad went to watch him one Sunday. Mum come back, she went, I've got you an interview at a bank. I said, doing what? She went, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, right. I went, when? She went, tomorrow. And her exact words were, do not fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I went along to this interview and I took a friend with me. I've got no intention of getting this job. So it were in Sheffield Town Centre, High Street branch. Me and mate went down to town for the day on the bus and... Walked in, he sat in the bank and all, went up to the front, asked for a lady called Julie Chant, who I know a lot to. And she came, she came over, she took one look at me, she looked over my shoulder, my friend sat in the banking hall. She went, come here. Took me in an office and she said to me, listen, drop the cocky attitude. I know you switched on. I've promised your mother a job and I'm giving you a job. And if you lie to her, she'll know because I'm going to ring her now and I'm going to tell her that you've got this job. Now get out of my office. So, so that 15, 16 year old walking through back through the bank, and my mate went, "How did it go?" And I was like, "I've got, I've got a job in a bank." And he went, "Doing what?" I'm like, "I still don't know." <laughs> so, the job was a cashier. So I started as a cashier on Saturdays and a couple of days in the week. And the cashier inside, I hated, and I was horrendous at. I think I got every record for every till error going every single day but I just fell in love with the relationship building with the conversations with the talking to people with the sales side of things and it just became it became a game just like I've always been very I'm a numbers man and for me it was just I worked out pretty quickly so every this was it's different now but this was back in the day when you go into the bank and you'd queue up at the till and yeah. the cashiers would be trying to get you for an account manager, let's upgrade your account, let's get your credit card. Do, do, you, do you want a loan to pay that credit card off? We can get you better savings on your, on your uh, better interest rate on your savings. As a cashier, every referral I made to one of the account managers that resulted in a sale, I'd get paid three pound. Right. So I was sat there working out, I could very easily double or treble my salary. So you did, and it got to the stage where I just became like, engrossed in this world of, sales and service and I read every book going like I just wanted to learn everything what was your favorite sales book I'm somebody that's I love sales myself it's called kiss right keep it simple series kiss kiss guide to sales so keep yeah. it simple series guide to selling and it was bible it was that thick this big it was dog-eared it went and it, it, I basically slept with this book it went everywhere with me yeah. every page was ripped to shreds covered in highlighters and I just I, it was like my bible um, so I read that inside that inside out, upside down on its head. And it got to the stage where people would avoid me. 
in the queue because I used to work, I was a cashier at the High Street branch in Sheffield. So biggest branch, I think it's one of the biggest branches in the region. So they'd always be queuing and they'd, they'd be in the queue literally hearing me pitch five or six people before me while you're waiting to come to the till. And you did not leave my till until you either sat down with one of the managers or you stormed out in disgust. <laughs> it was black or it was black and white as that. And yeah, so people would wait in the queue to not get served by me. <laughs> but I just I just fell in love with that. So do you know, and people ask me this all the time. It could have easily been cars, it could have easily been mobile phones, it could have easily been office equipment, but it just so happened that I I fell into it within the sort of financial services and then just worked my way up from there. Brilliant. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how like I I as well as Tom's talks, I run the business that my dad started, yeah. which is OSI, which is office furniture, school furniture, chairs and tables. And like when I tell people that I run a business that sells school furniture, they look at me like, school furniture? And I'm like, yeah, but it's not something that when I was growing up, I thought, yeah, yeah. Can't, wait to, can't wait to sell chairs and tables. But when you fall into something and you do it for long enough, it becomes your passion, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, exactly the same with me. And I remember like being like 16 and I won every award going up and down the country for most number of referrals to the account managers. I was getting sent on all these swanky events. But it... Financial services in general is a big drinking culture mm. and it used to be a lot worse back then. So they'd send us to London, they'd send us to, went to Paris, they'd send us all over the place on these incentives and they'd all be geared around boozing. I was 16. So they then had to pay someone from the Sheffield region, basically as a babysitter, as a chaperone for me, <laughs> to take me to these events. Um, and I remember like fighting from an early age. Like, the next step was to be an account manager to start be on the other side of it, start selling the loans, the credit cards, the account upgrades, the, the savings rate, everything else that came with it. And and I just fight and fight and fight. And they're like, no, you're not old enough. I'm like, but, but I am, I've, I've done this. I did all my exams when I was 16. Um, so I was more qualified. Cause I've got this thing in my head that I'm younger than everyone. I've got less experience, so I'll be more qualified. So I'll be, they can't say no to me. I did all these exams. I think I was 17 at the time. And I applied for this job and went, you know, you're too young. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. You're too young to take a bank loan. Therefore, you're too young to sell a bank loan. <laughs> and I'm like, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it on my 18th birthday, the job actually. And then, yeah, worked my way through the bank with Lloyd's TSB back then. And then I moved to Abu Dhabi when I was 22. What was the motivation to move to Abu Dhabi? So my best friend, John, um, John was 10 years, a bit of a mentor to me. So John was 10 years old, well, John's 10 years older than me. And when I was like 16, 17, 18, he were in his mid to late twenties, like larger than life character, like six foot three, all the women loved him. Every the men wanted to be him. He was one of the top like, advisors in the region. Super successful, drove a Porsche, nice Porsche, nice house. And I just wanted that. So I just pestered and pestered and pestered him basically just for him to teach me everything that he knew. I'd spend every minute of every day with him and we'd become really close. And then John moved to Abu Dhabi in 2008. Um, and I said, I want to come with you. And I think I was 18 at the time. And he's like, no, in 1920 at the time. And he said, look, let me get settled. And then as soon as I'm up and running, you can come out. And then 18 months later, he then phoned me up, said, right, the job's ready for you. And then I moved out there with him. Brilliant. And was that going straight into financial advising in Abu Dhabi? Or was it still sort of working your way in the banks and, and the account managing and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, so when I so when I was 22, I was one of the senior managers at Lloyd's. And then I went out to work with John, a bit like on the business development side. So basically booking calls for John, booking meetings for John. Mm -hmm. And I would always like to think that I've been driven, but that for me, it was like the penny just dropped mm -hmm. because... I was no longer paid a salary. It was all commission. commission. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and oh, I loved it. Yeah. And I, I remember like, cause I remember when I dropped to, so when I started working at Lloyd's Bank, so you're just jumping back, I started working at Lloyd's at the weekends and midweek. And then I went to college in the September. Didn't know what I wanted to do at college, but I just knew I didn't want to be a bin man or a market trader like my dad. So I started at college. And then I was there for six weeks. The first October half term came up and I worked all week and then worked out at the end of the week what we're gonna get paid. 
And I remember speaking to one of my other mentors at the time, a guy called Ian Twarick, who was one of the other top sales guys in the country. And I said to Ian, I said, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. I said, what qualifications did you have at my age? And he, I don't want to forget, he was like yesterday, got his toothpick, he used to have this toothpick in his mouth, and he leant back, pulled it out, he went, son, when I was your age, I couldn't spell my fucking name. <laughs> <laughs> and he got this thick Barnsley accent, but everybody loved him. And, and he said to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm at college. He said, what do you want to do? I went, I don't know. I said, I want to do this. And he, and he got, and he leant over and he got his piece of paper out of his drawer, threw it at me. And I opened it up and it got more zeros on it than I'd ever seen. And it was pay slip. Really? Yeah. And he, and he asked me again, what do you want to do? I went, I want to do this. <laughs> and he said, right, I'll tell you what, probably not the most responsible advice, but he said, go into college tomorrow mm. and tell them to shove it. <laughs> and that's what I did. And it took my dad three months to speak to me after that. Really? Oh, you yeah, were all broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was going to be the first Woodhouse to go to university. Like, I was going to be the one. My dad wanted me to be a barrister. <clears throat> and then when I when I sort of jacked college in, I threw my life away. Mm. And then it took me dad a few years then to recognise that I were sort of doing something for myself within the bank. Then I got to 22, senior manager on a lot, very good money for a 22-year-old. Then I went to him and said, Jack and Owen, dad. He's like, why? To not get paid a salary. <laughs> <laughs> Commission only. And that was the same. Took him three months to speak to me again. It's so strange that you say that as you've just said it, because it's so similar to my situation with my dad. My, so I'm, I was the youngest of four. Uh, my older brother, Alex, he didn't go to uni. Uh, he he went, started working for my dad at 18. He started working in the warehouse. Uh, my brother, Liam, wasn't the most academic. Didn't really know what he wanted to do in and out of different jobs. Obviously, sadly, not with us anymore. Uh, and then my sister Gemma, very bright individual, she went to university. She's five years older than me. She went for three months, hated it, and quit. So then it came to me, the youngest, uh, and I didn't want to go to university. I was very like, I just want to earn money. I want to start a business. I want to, you know, very similar to yourself. Yeah. And I said to my dad, I said, I don't want to go to university. I just want to start earning money. Like, I want to work with you. I'll look what you've done. And my dad's like, no, you're going to university. I'm like, right, okay. So I did sports business, a pile of shit. I went for three months <laughs> and I quit. And my dad was so upset with me. And it, unpopular opinion this, but, and I've had this conversation with people in the past. I don't dispute for one minute that my dad wanted the very best for me. However, how much of me going to uni and me becoming a barrister, mm. like my dad wanted, <clears throat> How much of that was actually for me or how much was for his own ego so he can tell his mates? Yeah, yeah. Because that will what upset him more than anything. Mm. And he even said it to me, he's like, but I've told everyone you're going to university. And I'm like, but it's my life yeah, and yeah. I don't want to do that. But now, 20 years later. Well, yeah, he, yeah. Me and my dad have got a strange relationship at times, but... Um, I think well, but if you'd have gone to the university, like obviously for me with the university, it's... Uh, each to their own, do whatever you want to mm. do. Do whatever you want to do, but, you know, how many people go to university because they don't want to do, and then they leave university with a qualification or a degree, and it has yeah. absolutely nothing all to do with- And a load of debt. And a load of debt, 50, 60 grand, and mm -hmm. then it doesn't actually quantify anything that they actually do yeah. later on in life. And I'm not saying don't go to uni if you want to go to uni, but it's just weigh up the options. Yeah. Um, and I, I said this with my own kids as well. Like, if they want to go, great, I'll fund it. I, mm. I've got plans aside; it'll be paid for. They'll not come out. They'll come out uni without a penny of debt. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to push them into it if they don't know what they want to do. If anything, mm. I mean, through the years of doing what I'm doing, I've got a very good network globally. If anything, I'll probably push them to working for someone that I know that runs a business for free, and I'll fund the lifestyle mm. while they work for free and just get build up some knowledge and some real experience mm. working in a proper company mm. um, until they decide what they, I'd rather, I'd rather them do that for three or four years. Like just shadowing people yeah. in different companies. Experience, isn't it? Yeah, it's you real learn, life experience. You learn more from doing than you do from yeah. sitting in exactly. a classroom. Yeah. So when you uh, went to Abu Dhabi then at 22 years old, and again, it makes me laugh because I was going to go to Dubai when I was 23 and do real estate. Okay. And again, it was a conversation between me and my dad because uh, at the time I was like doing most of the sales for my dad and getting yeah. all the business in. 
uh, and me and my dad would have a conversation like, your dad, you paid me fuck all, like, what's happening? <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I've been offered a job in uh, Dubai still in real estate. I went, oh, right, so, okay. How's that work then? And I went, oh, I don't get a basic salary. <laughs> it's all commission. He went, are you fucking mad? <laughs> yeah. It's the exact same conversation I had with my dad, with mum and dad. Um, but same thing, but I got out there and for me, it was just like, the planets had aligned. I was like, right, so you're telling me if I work twice as hard as him, I earn twice as much as him. Mm. And if I work <clears throat> extra hour a day than her, I'll get paid an extra 20% more than her. And they're like, yep. And it was just everything with numbers. Mm. So you got to the stage where I'd be in the office 30 minutes before anybody else. I'd leave the office 30 minutes after everybody else. We used to have this guy come in selling sandwiches. So I'd run downstairs in the morning, grab a sandwich, and my lunch break would be me eating the sandwich at my desk, like inhaling this sandwich five minutes, then working 55 minutes when everyone else were having an hour. And for me, it was just simple math. So I was like, look, for your, for the extra half hour in the morning, half hour in the afternoon, and the 50, 55 minutes I'm buying it myself at lunch, like for your five days, I'm essentially getting six. So even if I'm no better than you, I'm already earning 20% more than what you are and booking 20% more meetings than you and doing 20% more business than you. And then then it was also the natural progression of getting better at what I do. And it just became a game. Mm. Um, and I started doing really well, really quick, which also was a bit of a downfall because I moved out there at 22. And- Is it tax, tax free in Abu Dhabi as well? Yeah. yeah. And started earning more money than I could ever reimagine. Like I remember being 18 year old and my ambition in life was one day earning X amount and paying tax on it. I did that within six months of moving to Abu Dhabi at age 22. And it was like, oh my God, it, it was just surreal. But then I start, and I, because I've always been a stats man as well and I knew all my numbers. So I knew how many, how many people I had to call to get one to answer, how many people I had to speak to to book a meeting, how many meetings I had to book to get someone to sit, how many meetings we used to have to sit to get one seen. I knew what my deal size was. So I knew every time I picked that phone up, that were X amount of pounds and pence in my pocket. And I also knew then what my deal size was. And the da really dangerous thing is I then start, even though I, I tell people what to do with the money and the life savings, I weren't taking my own advice. Um, and then after like 18 months, I became an advisor as well myself and booking meetings for myself and doing my own business, seeing my own clients. And that's when, boom, I started earning more money again. And I started looking at expensive things as a, just a deal. So instead of that's going to, them business class fights are going to cost me X amount of pounds. That suite in that five-star hotel is going to cost me this amount. That watch is going to cost X amount. It were, that's just an extra deal. That's just an extra two deals. That's a deal and a half. So I was buying things with the attitude, I'll just work a bit harder next week and earn it back, yeah. which is a very dangerous game to play. Um, and everything was going fine until it wasn't and we ran out of money completely. When we were going through IVF, which were grim. Yeah, but, Well, the IVF thing was horrendous, but... Was that all still within Abu Dhabi? Yeah, yeah, so... so did you, sorry, did you move out with your wife to Abu or did you meet yeah no we we bought our first house together six months before I moved out um, which didn't go down very well when I told her I'd been offered the job <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine so I moved out in the February then Laura came out in September um, we then got married three years after that and then started trying to have kids um, which didn't work naturally for us so then after about two years we then went to go and, well, Laura talked me into it because I didn't want to go, went to a clinic, both got tested and found out that we couldn't have kids naturally. Right. So started going through IVF route, um, which out there is a very expensive game because there's no NHS, there's no financial support. Um, yeah, and it, it took us five rounds of IVF before we were blessed with the boys. Wow. Which was a, yeah. A very tough few years. And how old were you at this point? Oh God. Um, well, the boys are what? The boy, I'm 37, the boys are six. So, so mid to late 20s, probably like from 27 to 30. We're going through. Yeah, that's tough. Horrendous, mate. 
on top of the the lifestyle. It's hard to, the the age old saying of live below your means, but when your means start to get more and more expensive, it's, it's and, it soon spirals out of control, doesn't it? And that was the thing as well. So we changed companies from a financial standpoint. So we changed companies. This new company wasn't quite what we had promised. So I, I essentially didn't get paid anything for six months. Right. Our go we were going through IVF, um, like fifteen thousand pounds, twenty thousand pounds a time. Per time. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Um, so we're four. How many times? Five, five, five rounds. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we're forking all that out. A bit, and then it was at the time it was this victim mentality of why me? Mm. Why is it like that? And it was just after. Um, remember, it was a Brexit vote as well. So, it was the Brexit vote. The pound had gone through the floor. We were living in the Middle East. All the expats, all my clients, British expats, were all getting paid in Durham's. So all of a sudden, that affected their job security, and there were people worried about leaving. No one was investing, so it was like, why is the market shit? Why is nobody buying? Why is this new company shit? Why can't we have kids? And it were only really then when I stopped that victim mentality and sort of looked up at this huge four-bedroom house we were in, just me and Laura with a private pool, with a housemaid, with a full-time driver, in five-star hotels every weekend, flying business class everywhere we went. And I did this little exercise where I worked out how much money I'd earned since I moved to Abu Dhabi when I was 22 and how much I got left. And that for me was such a way could call. Just a quick one before we get back to the episode. We're trying to hit 5,000 subscribers before the end of the year. So if you love this podcast and you love what we're doing, then a quick and easy way to support it would be to hit the subscribe button. Thanks very much. Now let's get back to the episode. What was the reason why you didn't move back to the UK to do the IVF? Um, we were, my business. Mm. So we were happy out there. We were settled. Um, I was doing very well within the business. We were going through, yes, going through a bit of a rough, rough patch with it. I suppose though, if you... But that was that was life for us, yeah. you know what I mean? Like to save a bit of money coming back here to do it, uproot our life, and um, it, it was difficult as well because, like, when we had a, a great circle of friends, so we all went, we moved out together like early, mid, late twenties, and all couples. We'd all go out boozing together. Then we got married first, and then everyone started getting married. We then struggled to have kids. Everyone started having kids. So again, that was that were difficult as well because everyone around us was having these these babies and mm -hmm. and it was just it was just so painful every time. Yeah, but and now you're blessed with three three kids. Which I've got no air. <laughs> so yeah, so I've got six old year, six year old twin boys and a three year old daughter. And was it the same process with your daughter? Yeah, yeah. First time though. Wow. We, we breathe. Yeah, so it were five attempts for the boys. Um, in Abu Dhabi, we then moved back to the UK in 2020, and then we decided that we wanted another. So we literally got all the notes from everything that worked at the last clinic we went to, gave them to a clinic in Sheffield, and went copy that, yeah. and it worked. As if there must have uh, been some resilience within yourself and that mindset that you know you wanted kids after you know most people might have given up after that second or third attempt, knowing how expensive it is, but also the whole traumatic experience of it not working and having to deal with that whole process, but f to go through it five times. It it were all Laura ever wanted, my wife. Like all she's ever wanted to be is to be a mum. And we went into it very naively because, so when we got tested, they basically went, right, Joe, you've got a low sperm count. Laura, you've got a low, I think they call it AMH count, big like egg, egg count. So when you've got low sperm count, you've got low egg count, your chances of getting someone pregnant are slim. Your chances of getting pregnant are slim. Put that together, your chances are slim to none. But it got sold to us that it's an easy fix. We basically, I'm sure there's more to it than this, but yeah. we get one of them sperm, we get one of them eggs, we mix them together in a dish, baby. Yeah. That was like how naively we went into it all. And so we paid the 
14,000, 15,000 pounds, whatever it was for the first round at this clinic in Abu Dhabi. And then uh, what, Laura went through all the process. Laura went through a lot more than what I did with all the hormones she had to inject into herself, all the procedures and everything else. I basically just turned up, locked a room, walked out with a cup. Um, and we got a phone call from about a week after we got we got a phone call from the receptionist at the clinic and it was literally blase as I uh it's not worked do you want to book an appointment to come see doctor I'll not say his name but do you want to come book an appointment to see doctor x and it, it were because we just thought you paid the money you walk away with a baby happen, yeah. like it, it would never once you, you con think, we never once conceived the idea that this you, might not work you're thinking if I'm spending 15 grand yeah this better work yeah yeah. But never thought he wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, would you? And yeah, and then we just Until got, it and that was when, yeah. And that was when everything just came crashing down. Mm. Um, and I'll never forget, we went in to see him and just the look on Laura's face. Mm. Sorry. He broke, broke every single time. Every time. Um, that was tough. But I just felt it was also the whole IVF process, like it's as much sales as what any industry is. Like, so it went, right, well, it's not working because of this, so let's try this. And But this extra test is an extra five grand, this genetic testing, right? So we were like, yeah, all right, well, if that's going to work. And then it comes back that, no, that's not working either. But we can try this this time. And there's always an upsell. So we changed clinics and the second clinic we went to, we had this genetic testing done and again, it didn't work. And I'll, and again, I'll never forget, we went in to go and this doctor had the decency to ring us himself and said, come in and see me. We went to go and see him and he told us in person actually that it had not worked. I, I don't know what was worse, to be honest. Mm. Just getting over the middle of the phone or that, booking a point. Yeah, it was, it was horrible. Anticipation of what might be. But we had this genetic testing done and there were five embryos. And I saw this piece of paper on his table that said, boy, boy, girl, boy, next to the embryos. And what did that mean? That's basically what they were. Right. That didn't work. Like these oh. eggs hadn't survived sort of thing. And that was when it were like, fuck, this is real. Um, but yeah, it was a difficult time. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine that, but... I also believe you can remember like it was yesterday the look on Laura's face when you conceived those two baby boys. I could tell you exactly where we were in Dubai. Um, we were up in Dubai for the weekend and we were staying in this Airbnb and we were at, we were the guy from the Airbnb was meeting us upstairs. So he's ringing us, we were trying to meet him. And then as we were in the stairwell, the phone went in the lift, outside the lift, the floor, the phone went and it was the clinic. And I, I just remember like the phone cutting on and off and we had to ask them about three times. Um, yeah, and I oh, was best friend in the world. Yeah, but did you know, was it only at that point that you knew then it was going to be twins? No, so we just knew it had worked. Basically it's like, a, it's a blood test they do. Right. So it's like, yes, you've got whatever in your, a bit, an embryo in you. Mm. And I found out by text message that it were twins. Really? Yeah. So I was flying back and forth to Saudi quite a bit when we lived in Abu Dhabi. <clears throat> and so we'd gone through all this, failed four times, like never anything. And then, because you find out when it's, when it's IVF, you find out four days into the pregnancy. Not like 12 weeks, like a lot of people do naturally yeah. conceiving, like four day, four or five days. And obviously it's still critical at that point. There's still quite a large chance that you can miscarry and lose it and all the rest. Um, so this was probably a couple of weeks in and I'm boarding a flight from Saudi. So I'm in the lounge at Saudi in um, either General Riyadh airport, boarding a flight back to Abu Dhabi. And my phone went and I instantly, and Laura's crying her eyes out on the phone. She says, I'm bleeding. I says, what, what does that mean? She went, I'm bleeding. I don't, I don't know what's happening. And her best mate, one of her best mates is a midwife. So I said, right, ring Sarah, go with Sarah, go and get a scan. So she went and I said, look, I'm getting on the flight now. 
some of the flights you had Wi-Fi, some you didn't. I says, I'll not be able to talk to you, but just message me, let me know how you get on and I'll try and get a signal. And I got on the flight and I were on the flight for about an hour, longest hour of my life. Yeah, right. And I got a text message saying, um, embryos are fine, heartbeats, heartbeats are fine. Oh. And I went, oh, thank God. And then I just said to myself, oh, thank God, love you or something like that. She sent me a message back, read it. I said, I have, everything's okay in it. She went, read it again. So I sent a question back, you're saying heartbeats, S, question mark. <laughs> yes. So I went phone out, we were twins. Wow. I remember I just burst into tears on this flight and they were running from turn around. She went, oh, you all right? I said, yeah, and I told her, she burst into tears. <laughs> we just, yeah. yeah. Incredible. <laughs> God, it's not took you long, has it, to set me off? <laughs> Sod. <laughs> no. I think, it's, uh, I think it's incredible that you had the perseverance and the resilience that you didn't give up. You know, you, you, the love that you must have for your wife. Yeah. Um, it was never an option, to yeah. be fair. But, and, and, and I get a lot of people that message me now because I'm quite open about this and yeah, speaking seen, yeah. about it. And sort of men and women. And we which in a way I'm glad we didn't, but we should have done it at the time. Like we never had that conversation of, which I always tell anyone to have, like mm. as horrible as it sounds, you need to be aware that this may not work for you. Mm. Cause unfortunately done for a lot of couples, we were very blessed. And you need to also have the conversation of how many times you're going to do it or how much mm. you've got set aside or you're going to invest in it because you could be going forever. Um, so we never had that conversation and like if we completely ran out of money and we were going to take a break of 12 months before we went again. And it was actually my best mate, John, and I don't know if anybody knows this, but it was my best mate, John, that gave me the money for the fifth round. Wow. Um, and yeah, and that's the one that worked. Incredible. Um, but when we came back to the UK then, when we then going through IVF with Aubrey, my daughter, at that point then, I said to Laura, we had the conversation of three times. Like, we'll try it three times. If it doesn't work, we've got the boys. Um, I think it's incredible that you've gone through IVF five times and then you've been blessed with not just one, but- no, three but two and two. Yeah, two boys. <laughs> wow, um, incredible. So yeah, so, but, and again, I don't know if there's any science behind this, but when we were going through it with Aubrey back in Sheffield, with the boys, it were life or death. It were all we wanted. Mm. And it would just fail after fail after fail after fail. And the, the, the stress and the pressure Laura in particular put herself under, I, 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 that must have had a massive part to play. As with Aubrey, we were a lot more chilled out with it. Were you back in the UK? Yeah, with, with Brie we were, yeah. yeah. Um, the boys were, the, the boys were, um, the IVF for the boys was at Bourne Hall Clinic in Dubai. Okay. The boys were born in Abu Dhabi. And then with Aubrey, it was in uh, Care, Sheffield. Right. But like, we went into it with a view of, like, it, it, as cold as it sounds, like risk reward. Reward is we're going to get another baby. Mm -hmm. The risk is it's going to cost, because it's cheaper here as well, it's going to cost us 30, 35 grand if we do it three times and it fails. Yeah. But we'd sort of drawn a line in the sand which we really should have done yeah. with the boys as well. But, but you don't know what you don't know, do you? I know. But if we had it done, if we'd have drawn the line at yeah. four, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 it's yeah. not worth thinking about. And that's the thing, and I'm a big believer that as shit as life is sometimes, you find the magic in every moment. Agree, agree. And I, again, this is something that they, a good friend of mine and mentors taught me that, that within every bad situation, you need to find the gift in every negative situation. Yeah. And if I sort of look back throughout my life, like my biggest wins have come at my lowest moments. Like with with running out of IVF, running out of money going through IVF, that was when I got my financial house in order. Um, going through all that pain to have the boys, like I'm not saying I wouldn't have loved them as much as I do, but I, I'd, I'd worship them. You learn the most about yourself at your lowest points, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And that's what this podcast is all about, you know, mm. my, my life was adversity through losing my brother, 
come through the other side and I'll tell my story to help other mm. people. But this was the inspiration behind the podcast. Yeah. Bring in people that have got a story to tell and how you come through adversity and come through those challenges yeah. through the other side. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I bet you wouldn't be the person you are today if all that wouldn't have happened. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I've come to, I'd, well, I'd like to think I'm quite resilient mm. with things. Well, no, you definitely are resilient. You can't go through five rounds of IVF and not be resilient. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but like, even like when the boys were born, like, again, that would be sweet. Obviously, we've been waiting, so excited for nine months through this process got everything in place, everything was ready. Mm. And they were born a month premature. Right. It's completely normal for twins. Um, but they were both born with this like ultra rare salt wastage disease right. called pseudo hypoaldosteronism. Yeah, that's some helpful. I know, <laughs> especially with this accent. <laughs> um, and how, a, how, but they didn't know at first. All they knew is literally the boys were just wasting away. And they spent two, wow. three weeks in uh, neonatal intensive care. And Jasper in particular like, lost more than half his body weight. Wow. We were only five pounds to start with. And they didn't know what was wrong with him. Like they were chew feeding him. They were, and they just weren't gaining weight. And um, it just so happens one of the consultants who was actually a good friend now, uh, Dr. Akash, he had read this article years before about this rare salt wastage disease so he found this specialist in the uae he phoned her and she said right do this blood test um did the blood test sent it over to her and they got this salt wastage disease how did the what was the solution to that steroids and salt in the milk and just constant monitoring but is it something you still need to monitor now um not so much now um, but we'd still have to keep an eye on it a little bit. Fair but yeah, it was just, it was just like we've gone through all that and then, and then got these two little bundles of joy and it was just like, yeah. Very up and down. Roller coasters yeah. of life. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. That's life. <laughs> it's meant to test you, isn't it? Of course it is, mate, 100%. What brought you, so how long did you spend in Abu Dhabi? We were there for 10 years, 2010 to 2020. And what brought you back to the UK? Um. Laura had been getting a little bit fed up of it anyway. It sort of served it, run its course. So we were sort of like 60, 70% looking at coming back. And this was the summer of 2019. And we were going to come back for, because again, my business was in the Middle East. And I'd been trying to use Zoom for a year before anyone knew what Zoom were. So I knew it inside out, upside down on its head, but trying to get my clients to use it, who'd been used to seeing the whites of my eyes. And me, I remember trying to use it the first time. Phys so. Yeah, me physically <laughs> buying my coffee for the last four years. Yeah. Like That was where the stumbling point came. New concept. So again, the limiting belief I put around it was, I can't leave the UAE, my business is here. Mm. And Laura's like, well, I'm not happy. Like You're in Saudi four days a week. I'm a single parent half the week. I'd rather be a single parent in the UK with more family around. So we we try we were going to trial three months Laura being in the UK and me flying back and forth. Um, and then the day before we were due to do this, I got a phone call off my mum saying she'd been diagnosed with cancer. Um, found out it was terminal. Um, I'm sorry about that. So yeah, thank you. Um, but she passed away in 2021. Fortunately, but we then decided that we'll come back to the UK, spend as much time as we can with my mum. And as horrible as it sounds, if we hate the UK, she is going to die sometime soon. Um, after she passes, we, nothing stops her then moving back out. Um, but so again, what like, kept you in the UK then? We love it. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it. It's Rotherham, right. isn't it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, we love it back here. Good old Yorkshire town. I know, yeah. <laughs> Kids are happy. Are you from Rotherham initially? No, I'm from Sheffield. Right. No, I was from Rotherham. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, I was dragged up in Firth Park. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's where I was born, yeah. Um, but yeah, we just, we're in a lovely little village, outskirts of Rotherham, like, we're happy, it's great. Kids love it. Brilliant. Um, and I'm back and forth to Dubai quite a bit as well. Yeah, I've seen, and then, and, and, is that, I know you, you'd appeared on quite a few podcasts out in Dubai. Yeah. Um, was that all regarding financial uh, advice or, you know, finances or? Yeah, a lot of it is. Um, 
some of it's similar stuff to this, sort yeah. of like telling my story, sure. which seems to resonate with a lot of people. Um, I think just I'm quite open and honest with yeah. sort of some of the stuff I've been through. Um, but yeah, like when I'm out in Dubai, like I do have really like radio, newspaper stuff that I do and media. Um, golf as well, because the sun's always shining <laughs> out there, so that helps. I remember you just said about Zoom. I remember, because I started... What I really loved about your Instagram page when we first followed each other was how open and honest you were about all these different tips and whatnot you could give to people for to help them with the finances. Mm. Um, I remember it was actually 2020 when I started doing some investing. And I remember I my best friend Lloyd was doing day trading on oil and he made like five grand in a day and I was like, fucking get me on that, I'm gonna do yeah. that. <laughs> made 500 quid in about 10 minutes. I was like, this is amazing and then lost 50, 50, uh, 1,500 quid about 10 minutes later. And I was like, oh God, this is terrible. And my dad's, my dad, uh, stepdad is, was a financial advisor, he's retired now. And I was telling him, he was like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, it's the most riskiest game you can yeah. play. So if you're gonna invest, do it for the long term and buy some oil now while it's down, have a look at some other stocks that are down from their all time high and just hold long term. I was like, okay. So I bought some oil, and I remember, and this one again, I looked at Zoom and the stock price of Zoom just went through the roof because yeah. everybody was using it. But I remember the first time I'd ever tried to use it, I was, I, I just couldn't figure it At out. At one bit, Zoom was worth more than every US airline combined. Wow. It's insane. Yeah. But then it, it, it dipped like back down. down and, yeah. It's not recovered since. When it? doors start opening and yeah, people yeah. start going out in the real world again. Which is surprising though, because like you said, that so many businesses now are just run via mm. either Teams, Google or, or Zoom. Yeah. Um, but obviously that's the stock market, isn't it? You can't predict it. Yeah. So yeah. What, is, what is the best, if you could, in 30 seconds, to help somebody that is maybe struggling financially um, or just generally wants to start putting some money aside looking for the future, what, if you could give some form of financial advice within 30 seconds to a minute, what, what would it be? Get your ducks in a row. So it's doing the right things in the right order. So first of all is doing a budget. Okay. So making sure you're spending less than what you earn, which sounds super simple, but so many people get that wrong. So it's knowing what's coming in and what's going out. It's then paying yourself first. So day after payday, you have set amount, go to your savings and your investments, and then you spend whatever's left. And that way you always have much more at the end of the month. Um, and then it's all looking at, before you look at investing and before you we talk about which fund or which stock or which company to buy, you need to build up six months emergency pot. And then when you are investing, look at investing in things that will pay you an income and for the long term. And for me, typically it's three ways. It's property, stock market, and bonds. What is a bond? Bonds are just a loan. So take Zoom, as we spoke about earlier. So you can either buy shares in Zoom, yeah. which you then become a part owner of that company. Granted, albeit on a very small scale, but you share the profits, but you also share the losses. Mm. A bond is another way to invest in said company, but instead of you owning a part of that company, you just own their debt. Okay. So like you or I need a loan. Yeah. We need money, we have to go to a bank. You get a loan or you get a mortgage. Companies can do that, but they can also issue bonds. So they go, right, Mr. And Mrs. Investor, give me 10, 20, 50, 100,000 pound dollars, rubles, shells, whatever the currency may be. And in return, I'll pay you this amount of interest over this set period at the end of it, you're gonna get your money back. Right. So it's just a loan. And then in regards of, you mentioned about the emergency pot, what is the emergency pot? A six months expenses. So everybody, what your outgoings are on, on yeah. a monthly basis. So if you're earning five grand a month, and you're saving um, one grand a month, you're spending 4,000 pounds a month. Okay. Therefore you need 24,000 pounds, which is six months expenses, mm. sat in an emergency pot, should the shit hit the fan. So would you not just, so it's not just your mortgage, it's not just your bills, it's not everything. just everything. Because mm. I bet that could be quite confusing for people because yeah. people uh, probably underestimate how much they spend just on s small, yeah. small uh, transactions. Yeah. And when you actually look at your bank statement, which again, I, I believe a lot of people probably don't do that. Oh, no, no, no. How many times do you actually look at your bank statement and look at everything you have physically spent that month, not just your bills, your mortgage, your car, whatever else, like your five pound Greggs every other day, yeah. or your, your subway, or yeah. your Domino's. Exactly, because look, if you got, in, you got laid off tomorrow, mm. your kids still need shoes. 
Like, yeah. You still need to eat. Yeah. You still need to put petrol in your car. You still need to pay for your car insurance. Like Your yeah. kids have still got their after-school clubs. Life doesn't end just because you stop working, yeah. which is why I always say to people, build up this six-month emergency pot. Yeah. And some people say, oh, yeah, but Joe, that's a lot of money. I'm like, yes, it is. But it's even more money if you don't have that mm. and something does happen. And then you have to then resort to buying a credit card. Yeah. And then you build up credit card debt and then you've got the interest on that and everything. Else. Which it's, takes you 10 you steps You can back. quite quickly get into a, a lot of debt Oh, without yeah. even realising. Mm. So I, I remember it wasn't until, because I started working for my dad when I was 19, and like I said, I was I was on about £1,000 a month basic wage. And my dad said to me, if you want to earn money, Tom, you need to go out and sell. I was like, well, I want to earn money, so that's what I'm going to do. And it just so happened that I was relatively good at it. And I was earning good money at 21, 22, 23, 24 years old. But similar to yourself, I was spending it just as quickly yeah. as I got it. And it wasn't until lockdown where I got put on furlough, at like however much it was, and I had my mortgage to pay for. I just bought a BMW 4 Series, and then I was like, shit. I didn't have <laughs> I'm not going to pay for this. Yeah, I was like, crap. And then that was when I realised, oh, like, I need to become better with money. <coughs> and my best friend, Elliot, had just read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he went, read it, mate. It's the best, and I read that, and ever since then, my personal income and my savings and everything has just gone like that. Yeah. And now I've got what I've got. So thank you for Rich Dad Poor Dad. <laughs> yeah, but again, it's like that. Like for me as well, it's just making everything automated. Mm. Like I, people laugh at me when they, I, I, I live my life like a military operation. <laughs> like everything is planned down to the minute. Um, and people laugh when they see my diary, it gives people headache, but I, and I, I run my finances exactly the same as I run my time. It's like, for me, I find so much freedom in structure and routine mm. and I make, and I outsource as much as I possibly can. So things like, like I said, the day after payday, just have standing orders, leave your account yeah. for your savings, for your investing. So you haven't got to physically do it every month. So you've not got to think about it. So it just looks after itself. You know, it's for the average retail investor somebody that's thinking about getting into doing investing they've built up the emergency pot what would you advise in the simplest way which fund which app would you use to give somebody a, a, like a just getting started depends where they're based so a lot of my clients are based uh, british uh, expats living overseas so again for those there's different investment platforms that they can set up if you're in the UK, the best thing is the stocks and shares ISA. So I'm guessing most of your listeners are in the UK? Yes. Right, so in the UK, stocks and shares ISA with the likes like your Vanguard, your Moneybox, your someone like that, mm. and just make it automated. Um, and again, they'll all have their own like risk-rated portfolios, which basically means in English, you click a button, you do you answer five or six questions on how much risk you're happy taking. That'll then recommend, we recommend this fund or these funds here, and just buy that. Mm. don't turn into Warren Buffett overnight don't think you're a day trader yeah. um, do you know what's the funniest thing about that is is that I I've got my eyes I use trading 2 on 2 app, okay um, and I like to think I'm Warren Buffett from time to time <laughs> and I'll buy certain stocks like individual stocks like I bought this uh, is it pronounced REIT REIT um, R-E-I-T Real Estate Investment Trust yeah bought one of them because I looked at the dividend and it was like 17% dividend. And I banged like 20 grand into it. But it's paying like 200 pound a month, but I'm minus three grand on it. <laughs> but then the one that's performing the best is I've been putting into Vanguard S&P 500 yeah. for the last four years. And out of everybody, that's outperformed the lot. And it's like, don't, your advice exactly is don't try and be Warren Buffett and buy individual yeah. stocks, just buy a fund that tracks the market and just let it do its thing. And I did the same thing myself. Like just before we got married, um, I got offered, I got told of this hot tip of this oil exploration company based in Kazakhstan who just struck oil, literally. So I put our entire wedding fund into, no, nine months before I got married, so I put our entire wedding fund into <laughs> buying shares in this company. You're going to know how this ends, aren't you? So... I'm guessing you didn't tell your wife. No. <laughs> and it just tanked. No way. Went down and down and down. And I put 30 grand in and I ended up selling out for about seven grand. Yeah. Um, luckily, I managed to find the money elsewhere and the wedding still went ahead and she still agreed to marry me after I told her. <laughs> but 
But again, that for me were a very expensive lesson of yeah, but just keep it simple. Yeah, definitely. What's your thoughts on crypto? Um, look, if people want a small portion of their overall investments in it, one to five percent, fair enough. Mm. But the problem with crypto, and I know NFTs have gone quiet of late, <laughs> but don't talk to about NFTs. It's exactly the same though. It's, <laughs> do you know what? It's the best marketing I've ever seen in my industry. Yeah, yeah. It's genius. It's absolutely genius, and they've made it trendy and mm. they've made it cool. And and that's the thing. Like too many people are putting too much money in it that don't understand it. Mm. Um, and arguably, I don't think anybody really properly understands it because it's that new. If you look at the stock market, if you look at the property market, we've got 100 years worth of data. If you look at crypto, it's been around for two minutes in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so look, if you want to punt, go ahead, but mm. don't be putting your life savings into it. Like I've come across so many people that have, um, that are very loud when it's on its way up, but when it's yeah. coming, when it's on its way down again, they're, they're not. I think now I, I, I bought a fair bit of uh, Ethereum, Solana and Bitcoin, and then I put like a couple hundred quid into the ones that nobody knows about just to see if anything happens. But the way that I've done my investing, which you probably will disagree with, is I've done it on more of a psychological standpoint. I've not put in money that I can't afford to lose. So then when I'm in the red, I've not shit myself and sold. I have weird. But that's my that's that's my view on crypto. Okay. I only put in money in yeah, only yeah, put money yeah. in it, you're willing to so lose. I bought um I think I put about five grand into Coinbase when it went public on trading. Okay. Two. Yeah. And then it fell through its ass. And I was minus five grand for two years. But I held and then the bull run came again, whenever it was, the beginning of this year. And then I was up fifteen grand. And I was like, this this makes sense. Yeah. You know, but obviously some stocks will stay you'll stay in the red forever like I bought some uh, lithium stock like a penny stock American, American battery something like that. I've been minus 1500 quid for about five years yeah. and it's I can't see it ever recovering and, and this is why for me I just buy funds that track the market yeah, yeah. and I just keep buying and I just keep buying I find it really interesting I love like the concept behind the stock market and for me it's been a great way of when I put when I buy a stock and I put X amount in, I know that then I can't do anything with that money because it's like a habit, you know. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to sell it, and and it's the difficulty of selling it is then keeping you from redrawing that money, and, so then it builds up over time. And that's part of my issue with crypto as well. So like, if you look around, you're living in the stock market. Yeah. That telly, them trainers, them jeans, that watch you've got on, like the microphones we're using, everything is made by companies that operate on the stock market. Yeah. Like all it is in its most basic form, it's just a marketplace. It's just real companies selling real things to real people. Mm. And we're spending money with all of them companies every single day. Cryptocurrency on the other hand, I can't, it's not underwritten essentially by anything. There's, mm. there's nothing there. It's just code. Yeah. Um, How does the, uh, again, in the simplest terms for people watching, you how would you describe the stock market and how would you how would you say it works in terms of if somebody was to go on trading two on two now they're pressed by what dictates whether that stock goes up and whether that stock goes down how does that work i'm not an economist however <laughs> in the simplest way <laughs> right so look like i said all the stock markets it's just a collection of real companies selling real things to real people so we're in barnsley now it's like going down to barnsley market yeah. You've got a butcher's, you've got a baker's, you've got a candlestick maker's, you've got a sweet shop, you've got um, all these card shops, you've got all these different companies that are selling things. If you look at the FTSE 100, which is the UK stock market, essentially, which is the 100 largest companies in the UK, it's just an average value of all those companies. So a little bit more to it than this, but if every company's value increases by 1% today, the FTSE increases by 1%. Mm. If every company drops by 1%, that it drops by 1%. Mm. And all you're doing every, if you're investing into a fund what tracks that, every month your pound, 100 quid, 1,000 quid, 10,000 quid, whatever it is you invest, automatically your money then just gets split across all them different companies. Mm. Which is why if one of those companies then collapses, so let's say you were buying shares in, um, HSBC for argument's sake, okay? And HSBC disappeared tomorrow, your money's gone. Mm -hmm. If you buy shares in the FTSE and the FTSE has a holding of HSBC, which is say 1% of the total value and HSBC collapses, it won't, it'll affect the fund on a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like anything, it's economies of scale, age old basket, don't, you know, you've had a few off Love Island, they'll be like, age, don't pour eggs in one basket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it, am um, I right in thinking that what dictates the price of a stock going up is the amount that people are buying at that time? Is that right or is that wrong? A lot of it's speculation as well. Yeah. So a lot of it is profit, losses, data coming out of the company, but a lot of it is people's thoughts and feelings of that company in the future. Um, and and a lot of the a lot of the thoughts and feelings of that company is money coming in, money coming out, and and I've heard this is why I say to people like with the news, just ignore the news, because too many people make a thirty year investment decision based on the last thirty seconds worth of news. Mm. Like if you're investing for the long term, what is happening today is none of your business. Mm. So just shut it out. And as you know yourself, like all the news portrays is the most negative, the most vicious, the most evil side of any story, mm. because that's how we're hardwired. We're hardwired for safety to seek out that information. Mm. Um, so that's what they that's what they promote and that's what they push. Mm. I pur I purposely avoid the news like the plague. Yeah, because of that reason. Because I want to be the most positive version I can. Oh, it's depressing. When you watch the news, nothing is ever positive, isn't it? No. Um, Joe, you've been amazing. Thank you for being so open and honest. Uh, I'm sure that your story will help people watching that may be considering IVF, been through a similar experience. Mm -hmm. Just one last question before we finish up. How old were you when you started trying for IVF? 27, I think. If you could go back to 27-year-old Joe, what would you say to him? Oh, God. What wouldn't I say to him? Um, I lived a very different life back then. So I was very unfit. I was massively overweight, which obviously I'm guessing didn't, well, I know it didn't help with struggling to conceive, didn't help with us not being able to conceive. Um, what would I say to him? I first used to get your shit in order because I were a train wreck, if I'm completely honest. My head space were all over the place, all boozing every weekend. I was spending every money we got, God send. Um, so really just take some responsibility. Time to grow up, son. When was it that you, because obviously I've, we follow each other on Instagram and I see that you're very much into your fitness now, you're looking after yourself, you're keeping fit. When did the love for that start? When my mum went diagnosed with cancer. Right. So, summer 2019, call it fate, call it whatever you want, but I were, at the time, I was 120 kilo. Um, yeah. I'm five foot nine. So I looked like I'd swallowed a beanbag. I, I were out of breath climbing the stairs. I couldn't lift my arms off so far above my head. I was in such bad shape. And found out my mum got diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, and it was just like this rocket up my arse. Like, she wasn't able to then see my kids grow up. Mm. So she had that choice taken away from her. And I just looked at myself and the state I was in, and I just thought, I, I wanted to see my kids grow up. I wanted to be an able dad. I wanted to kick a football around when they got a bit older. I wanted to, I wanted to see them get married. I wanted to see them graduate. If they want to go to university, I wanted mm. to see them make something of their life. Yeah. And the lifestyle I were living, that wasn't conducive of. So I had this epiphany moment and then literally, well, it wasn't straight away because when I found out when we got terminal cancer, I launched my phone into a, a lake in a huff. When I then got my phone switched back on, new phone the next day, um, the first message that I opened up was one from a guy called James Goff, who was my first fitness coach. Um, and it was a sales message. I help, um, biz I help successful businessmen lose fat, get more energy, do this, do this, do this. So I just messaged him back saying, I'm in. He's like, let's jump on a call so you, I can run through costs, I don't care what it costs, I'm in. Um, so yeah, and that when it all started. And then again, like I say, I'm, I'm a numbers man. So it was just getting a routine in place. So it was getting weighed every morning. It was getting me steps in, it was getting me sleep in, it was training at the time three times a week. And then every day I was seeing that scale weight go down and when I'm in the gym tracking my numbers, I was seeing the number of reps increase and the weight increase, and it just became a bit of an addiction. Addiction, I was oh, about to say the same thing. 
I suppose, yeah. Do you not think though as well, like for yourself, you're obviously entrepreneur, businessman, you're doing very, very well. How much has your business, but your life improved as a result of changing your daily habits? Drastically. And the foundations of your life? Oh, night and day. So I've got so much more energy. I'm so much happier. I've got so much more clarity. Um, yeah, like on, I've got so much more confidence as well. Like I've always been a confident person and I wouldn't have said when I was massively overweight that I didn't feel confident. I did, but there were always that little bit like situations like now, like I'd be going to a meeting. If there weren't a table in front of me, I'd be pulling, I used to wear a suit and tie a lot. Yeah. I'd be pulling the shirt down to make sure it weren't gaping here and just little things like subconscious things like that. Um, that when I look back, like I suppose I now take for granted a bit, yeah. but it's like a newfound confidence. Oh yeah, yeah. Big I time. say that like for me personally, and I know you're the same because I've seen it on uh, Instagram. You train first thing in the morning, don't you? Yep. And for me, the reason why there's two reasons why I do that is because one, my number one priority will always be my health, mm -hmm. no matter what. But two, when I train first thing in the morning, I am on fire. Yeah. For the rest of the day, I've got, yeah. like you said, so much more clarity. Mm. I feel already self-accomplished because I've done something. Yeah. Like, like, for example, I went out on a rare night out um, on Saturday in Manchester. I had a little bit too much to drink. Felt a bit sorry for myself yesterday. I said, no matter what, I'm still getting to the gym for six o'clock yeah. Monday morning. I got there, it wasn't the best session, did a bit of a run, had my ice bath. And How I've, much better did you feel straight after it? Amazing. Yeah. And it's, I say to everybody, all the people that I work with, always focus on your health first and everything positive will come as a byproduct. Yeah, and, and again, like for me with kids and that, like now it's it's about setting that example. Cause like both myself and my wife, we both take a training nutrition really seriously. your wife's just done a photo shoot. Yeah, she looks yeah, amazing. Yeah, she looks incredible. Amazing. So like we, we both do it. So like the kids see us, I mean, some people might think it's a little bit extreme, but this is how our life, like we we have, um, we're both on a meal plan. We have us food weighed out. Mm. We get we have meal prep companies that we work with. So they see that, like yeah. they see us going to the gym. Like they see us, um, planning as everything for the week around that so the kids are growing up in an environment where that's completely normal so again Setting the president yeah 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 i love it joe thanks again matt likewise mate thank you cheers buddy pleasure cheers